started. Um, so today we're, uh, we're delighted and honored to have Catherine Tucker uh, here to present her paper on uh, algorithmic bias. Uh, she is the uh, Sloan Distinguished Professor of Management and Professor of Marketing at uh, MIT, also the chair of the MIT Sloan PhD program. She works on, uh, which is work on online advertising, digital health, social media, uh, privacy, um, and generally has the ability to pick out exactly what issue is going to be incredibly hot and timely and have a paper ready in time uh, for the debate. Uh, and so I also have to uh, apologize. We had a discussant um, uh, from the University of Maryland, and we realized over the weekend that I told her that the talk was on Wednesday. Um, so she might still come on Wednesday, and you all can hear the discussion. Uh, no, uh, so it's my fault entirely, um, not hers. Uh, but I will do a, dis a brief discussion, and then we'll open it up uh, for questions. Oh, well, thank you for that lovely introduction. So I'm Catherine Tucker, and I'm going to be presenting joint work with Anya Lambrecht, who is a professor at London Business School. Now, the one thing I want to say is I know that in DC, the convention is that we all sit very silently and politely throughout a talk, but you're very welcome to answer, ask questions. Uh, especially if you don't understand stuff, that's a really useful question to ask because that gives me an opportunity to be clearer. Now, what is the research question? Well, the research question here is what is it that may make an algorithm appear biased? And Scott, you know, just gave this lovely introduction saying, gosh, you know, she's very, very good at picking hot research questions, but I take absolutely no credit for this whatsoever because the genesis from this paper actually came from the FTC. And um, it comes from not even this year, but last year's FTC privacy conference. I went to it naively with a nice little empirical paper about the consequences of privacy regulation as I did. And I discovered that was completely behind the times in that most of the papers were actually focused not on the idea of privacy or the inherent trade-offs of privacy, but instead around the ideas that algorithms could be biased and that we should be concerned about this in the form of database discrimination. And these were really interesting papers. They were written by computer scientists who could deploy great scripts and other things. And what they tended to do was they tend to document a pattern of what appeared to be discrimination in the way that ad algorithms worked. And two big examples of this, Latanya Sweeney, uh, who wrote a lovely paper about how if you search for an African-American name on Google, you're more likely to see a ad for a background check than if you put in a white name. And then there was also this data paper, which is very computer science, and it was mainly a proof of concept paper, but it was looking at um, whether or not if you went to India, you saw Google showing more ads for an executive coaching service or not if you're a male or female. Now, these were two great papers, but being written by computer scientists, they were very focused on the techniques, right? How do you gather this kind of data, which might allow you to document uh, a computer science algorithm and its behavior. Um, and as a result, they weren't really interested in the why. And what I'm going to try and do in this paper, which is different, is to look at an instance where an ad serving algorithm appears to be biased and try and understand what, what made it biased. Right? That's the idea. And I think this is important because this receives, this literature, obviously it was the FTC, it's received a lot of um, uh, attention in the press and I think in DC in general. But it seems to me that if we want to fix this problem, we should at least try and understand what's going on. Now let's just talk about the general problem. So the general problem is that if you make the mistake of going to LinkedIn, trying to search for Stephanie Williams, then it will immediately try and correct you for the temerity of doing so and tell you, no, you maybe wanted to search for Stephen Williams. Now, 
As I say, we haven't really documented too much why this may happen, but if you read the popular literature at least, I think there's sort of four leading uh, explanations. One that is always met with, talked about is this idea that tech is dominated by white males. And there's an idea that white males to their own devices wouldn't even think that someone could be called Stephanie and may hard code it into the algorithm. Uh, other more nuanced explanations is that an algorithm learns bias from the data it was trained on. So for example, LinkedIn was using a lot of data, seeing how people used it, and discovered from that data that people tended to want to search for men, not women, or male names, not female names. Uh, it could be it's just re actually present behavior, not even historic behavior, and it learns it over time. Um, I'm gonna add a fourth exclamation, which maybe reveals my bias as an economist, which is also that we can't neglect, though, this is all the computer science, but I think we can't neglect the economics, which may also explain why algorithms could be biased. So what we're going to do is we're going to use data on a large-scale field test on STEM ads, that science, technology, engineering, and math career opportunities in 190 countries. And the big headline is that we set it up as being gender neutral, but this ad ended up being shown to more men than women. Now, why that might this perturb us that an ad designed to promote careers in science, technology, engineering, and math would be shown to more men than women is because if you look at public policy, it's pushing us exactly the opposite way, right? There's a lot of concern that in STEM, females are underrepresented. And so it's somewhat concerning if we have an ad algorithm, for whatever reason, deciding that this ad should be shown to more, ad, to more men than women. So I think if you were to sort of think about what makes this paper interesting, is that often with ad bias papers, it's difficult to know why we care, right? If we see different ads for shoes, why might we care? Probably we don't care that much. Uh, I think, you know, what makes this important is that we've chosen a topic for the ad, which we might really care about if we see gender disparity in terms of who it's been shown to. Now, I'm an economist. I'm not the writer of murder mysteries, so I'm going to tell you why it happens straight away with the idea that then you can sort of be thinking about it throughout the rest of the presentation, which is that ultimately the reason this happens is not because of any of the reasons we've thought about before in the literature. It's not reflecting anything to do with supply constraints, how women behave when they see the ad, even some underlying sexism in training data the algorithm may have picked up. Instead, it just represents pure economics, which is that this ad algorithm is programmed to try and cost minimize for the advertiser Female eyeballs are more expensive than male eyeballs. And therefore, if you let the ad algorithm make the choices to try and minimize costs for the, ad, the, ad, the advertiser, you're going to end up with a situation where these females end up seeing the ad less. OK, so why does this matter? So it matters because, to my knowledge, it's the first paper to actually try and explore why. And what we find out is a little bit more complex than I think a lot of the popular literature or debate uh, currently recognizes, which is that apparent bias may not be intentional, but may be the result of a complex system of economic behavior, which leads to something that looks like apparent bias. And the one thing I just want to emphasize is that having presented this paper quite a few times, people often in the audience feel the need to start fighting with us immediately and keep on saying, well, this is not discrimination, this is efficiency. And that's actually kind of our point, but somehow people sort of skip past this. We're not saying it's actually discrimination. Instead, it's something far more complex, which I don't know if we really had quite have words for but we might think of as the consequences of allowing algorithms into a complex system. 
Now, this matters for policy because obviously I told you about the FTC conference. They love the idea of something which is called algorithmic transparency uh, or how it is that algorithms actually operate. I would say in Europe, they've gone even further. Uh, Chancellor Merkel has taken a great interest in this topic, got to grips with some really quite technical terms and made a big call for transparency when it comes to algorithms. And I think what our paper is saying is that though algorithmic transparency might sound like a very sort of sexy call to arms, right? Who doesn't want more transparency in their life? It's not quite clear that this is really a policy solution in that if you think about the underlying cause we identified in this case of apparent bias, just putting the algorithm out there isn't going to allow you to see, oh, in line eight of the code, there's this place where they've hard-coded bias against females. Instead, something very much more complex and nuanced is going on. Okay, so now I'm going to go in more detail a little bit about the test. And first thing to say is that the origins of this test is quite interesting. In that, as I say, I came back from the uh, FTC conference I really wanted to work on this issue, and I posted an ad on our undergraduate research opportunities website. Now, the reason this matters is that I'm a business school professor, and usually at MIT, if I post ad opportunities, all our MIT undergraduates politely ignore me. But this time, I got over 50 applications because undergraduates really were very concerned about the potential for algorithmic bias. And so if there's luxury of people wanting to be involved in the research project, we split them up into two teams, uh, one which just sort of ended up being more MIT focused and one which ended up being more Wellesley focused, just because of bus timetables from what I understand. Now, the MIT focused team ended up spending three or four months building the world's most complex script, which would allow them to analyze this problem. Uh, we never actually reached the end of it because it was such a complex script, but it would have been magnificent if it had worked. And then what was amazing about it was that this Wellesley team like, really saw, saw straight to the end of the problem and decided to run a field test. And they deserve all the credit for setting this field test up. They contacted a website. They ran the campaign on their behalf. And this was a campaign. Basically, it was a campaign designed to enhance clicks on a website which promoted STEM careers and gave people advice about how to break into STEM. Now, you know, it's when you hear the words field test, you think of something more like a field experiment or an A-B test, it wasn't that fancy. Instead, all that's gonna vary is the fact we're actually doing it and the fact we did it in 190 countries. And in each case, we made sure in each country that the ad was seen by 5,000 people. Now, this was done on Facebook and the way that Facebook works is it allows you to choose quite specific criteria. We were actually intentionally unspecific. And all we said was we wanted to show the ad to people over the ages of 18 in that particular country. And we were very careful not to specify any gender. Now, I'm just going to remind people of the obvious for those of you who don't work in online advertising which is that it's important when understanding ad algorithms to understand that at their back is a very complex auction. And this auction runs in real time and it represents a competition between advertisers to try and win the right to show their ad to a particular pair of eyeballs. And you winning the auction is not just a function of the money you pay, that's definitely a part of it, but it's also a function of what the ad algorithm thinks is the likelihood of someone actually clicking on your ad and therefore you paying the website. Of course, you're not alone doing this. Other bidders are also bidding and the out your outcome is gonna depend on them and that's gonna become important. Now, the data is really quite straightforward. And this is the good news. I know we've got a lot of academics in the room, so it's not necessarily good news for all of you. For those of you who are not academics, the good news about this paper is it can really be summarized in one table. And this table 
breaks up the ad segments in the way that Facebook thinks people should be divided up, which is into men and women in various age groups. And impressions is a name in advertising for how many P times the ad was shown. And then this click rate is the percentage of people who actually clicked on the ad. Now, what to take from this table? First thing, look at these numbers. And what you should see immediately is that women were always shown the ad fewer times than men. Um, and that's especially the case for women in this sort of period of their life, between the ages of 35, 34, and around that. Uh, if you're looking for an explanation based on the click rate, how many times does the, do women and men click on the ad, we don't see much justification for this distribution in the click rate. And if women actually ever saw the ad, then their good news is, is that they were actually more likely to click on it than men. Okay, so three things I want you to make from the war data. First of all, women saw the ad less times than men. That's particularly the case for younger women. And it can't really be explained by women clicking in a different way from men. Okay, so what we actually do in the paper, and I'm gonna go quickly through this bit, is that we, you know, you've seen the raw data. I'm really not gonna be able to change it much by putting a econometric specification on it, but I did. And when you put it in an econometric specification, and that allows you to put controls in for the time, the date, all these kind of things. You're going to get exactly this same pattern. All that's changing now is the numbers that I'm now doing it on the day campaign level. So it's not at the aggregate level now. And you're going to see this consistent pattern that on average, women really see the ad less than men. And that is particularly driven when you look at women in the ages between maybe 25 and 54. Now, um, as I say, the most, uh, the, often, the most often discussed reason for algorithms to be biased is they learn the bias of humans. But we don't see any bias in this data in that women actually click on the ad more than men. And just as you saw in the raw data, this holds when I look at the econometric or the more detailed specification. And I continue to say it's not really mediated by age, but the women on average do click on the ad more than men. So it can't be the case that the ad algorithm decided not to show to women because they appeared not to be interested. Uh, so what could be going on? Well, another explanation which is sometimes raised is maybe they're just fewer women, right? Fewer women, I could explain it. Uh, so we looked at the evidence to see if indeed women spend less time on Facebook. Uh, the answer is a resounding no in the literature. At least every piece of recorded data suggests women spend more time on Facebook than men. Um, you know, something else you might be worrying about is, gosh, well, Maybe the ad algorithm was trying to do something more clever than we were thinking of. And maybe it decided it was just going to try and show the ad to fewer women because they clicked more and it was balancing clicks. Now that goes against what Facebook is promising advertisers, so it seems unlikely. But other reasons we think it is unlikely is that... We don't see any of that balancing act across ages. The ages are really off, right? If you actually look at the number of clicks. And so I don't really think you can explain this in terms of balancing act. And even if you thought it was a balancing act, then well, surely there's something a little bit disturbing about it anyway, because fewer women are actually being exposed to this potentially useful website. Now, the next set of regressions really excited us. And they were the reason we ran the ad in 190 countries. In that what we wanted to do was to find out whether the ad algorithm had learned any bias from previous behavior in that country. And we thought, well, that could provide an explanation of our behavior 
Obviously, there are many different countries among the 190 countries, and some of them are quite patriarchal, and maybe the ad algorithm had learned something like that. And so what we did was we collected World Bank data, which captures different ways of looking at labor market opportunities for women in each country. And we looked to see what happened there. And what we found out was really disappointing, if you, this is why you were doing this, in that we found nothing. Uh, it wasn't the case that countries which were more patriarchal showed any tendency to show the ad to fewer women. In fact, if anything, the opposite was the case in that the behavior we saw was actually really pronounced most among richer countries. Uh, most pronounced in countries like South Korea, Japan, the US, Canada. Places where, you know, you know, maybe South Korea, but certainly Canada, we're not really sort of thinking. There's a huge patriarchy issue sort of going on, which can explain it. Of course. No, just over the age of 18 in this country. Okay. Intentionally open. Okay. Um, and so that left us having like concluded, sadly, that this big idea didn't work. Uh, we remembered at that point we were economists and that there was a price mechanism in place and that maybe that could actually explain what was going on. And what we did to explain this, to sort of explore this, was to actually look to see, well, what Facebook itself was telling us about how much money we should have been paying to each women and men separately. And what we found out is that our, Facebook's very nice. They give you this data. And our team from Wellesley collected this data. And they found out that an average across the world on Facebook, uh, female eyeballs cost five cents more than male eyeballs. Um, but what I want to just emphasize is that that becomes more and more pronounced among younger women and that for them there really is quite a large discrepancy in that we can see that there's almost, well, you know, we can sort of say around a 15 cents increase, right? So there's a big difference in how much you have to pay for younger men and younger women. Now, you know, we found out, having made this discovery, that we were the, not the first to notice that. Indeed, if you trawl the internet, there are places which give advice for advertisers which have remarked on this problem before, on this issue before. They have catchier titles than we academics are allowed. But you can see, right, the general idea is that men are cheap on Facebook for whatever reason to advertise to. And so it's not just us, right? This is like a general phenomenon. And so we were like, gosh, so men are generally less expensive. And that can explain why an ad algorithm that was just trying to be cost effective might end up showing the ad to more of these cheaper male eyeballs than female eyeballs. And then we sort of had to ask ourselves, as you do, it's okay, but is this a mistake, right? Is it that advertisers themselves are making a mistake bidding up female eyeballs? And we actually found evidence in another data set that probably wasn't the case in that if you actually look at female behavior relative to men on social media ads, they have this very attractive property that where men and women are both happy to click on ads, women, if you take our data, which is on household items, so a bit removed, seem more likely to convert. So in other words, the return of investment on a female eyeball is indeed higher than for a male eyeball so it's completely rational, right? There's a reason why advertisers are willing to pay more. Okay. And, you know, I'll just continue to say this is not new. Uh, and not only is it just direct ROI, but there's other external evidence from around the place suggesting that indeed women do are more likely to control purchasing decisions. Okay. Now, so we did this and we sort of thought we had an explanation. And then we presented it at the MBR, and we had a wonderful discussant, and the discussant said, gosh, well, this is very interesting, but it's just about Facebook. Is this a general result? 
And then the lovely thing about this kind of academic work is that usually when a discussant, especially an economist discussant, asks you to do something, that's like eight months, two years of your life gone. We managed to do it in three days, which I think is the record for ever responding to criticism from an economist. And we set up tests, this time just focused in America, and all the major ad platforms we could find. And these are all tests for the same website promoting STEM careers. And so we did it on Google, in the Google Display Network. And we found there actually a very similar pattern. Maybe there are actually, if anything, slightly fewer impressions to females than males. But we saw the same pattern. More women, fewer women seeing the ad. They click if they do. And they're more expensive. Um, we also did it again on Instagram. Now, Instagram was a little bit unusual in that, first of all, you know, I was obviously very sexist. I didn't know that there were many men on Instagram, but there are many men on Instagram. Uh, but what we discovered about the men on Instagram is that if you ever show them a career-related ad, they get very excited. And this was the one ad platform we found where men were actually more likely than women to click on the ad for whatever reason. And the moment that happened in our data, everything got really distorted. In that you were talking about the ad algorithm actually learning, it learned very quickly that men who were cheaper would click more. And you can see we have this huge discrepancy in that it's sort of like 15% uh, female impressions or female eyeballs, 85% male. Um, we went and did it on Twitter. Twitter replicated again the same pattern that women saw it less. Um, though they weren't very explicit about how many times they clicked. For some reason, they don't share that data. Okay, so in other words, we did this on Facebook. First of all, did a deep dive into the why, and then we found the same pattern on every other platform. So one of the limitations of this paper, there were obviously limitations. First of all, it's a very descriptive paper. We were sort of interested, did it. Um, bigger uh, caveats. We just look at gender. Why gender? Well, gender is one of the things that Facebook actually knows about you. They collect that data. What really troubles me is all the stuff we don't really have data on and which we can't measure, right? We don't really know what's going on there. Um, we don't tackle any of the big problem, uh, questions which economists never think appropriate to tackle in that we end up with this situation which looks a bit like a bias on paper. Females see the ad less than men. But it's done for reasons of trying to maximize efficiency, which makes it really hard and brings us back to the entire system of discrimination literature in economics, which we've never really resolved. Um, the other big economics question is what is the counterfactual, right? We may worry that ad algorithms do this, but is it any different than what a TV network may do? Uh, what newspapers may do if we had an advertising strategy there. We just don't know because we don't have that kind of data. So what's the punchline? The punchline? An ad we might think of as actually socially useful ends up being shown more to men than women, even though we intended it to be gender neutral. And it's not because the algorithm's learned anything or it's picked up prejudice. Instead, it's to do with the economics of the situation where women as a demographic are more expensive to advertise to. Uh, they're more expensive to advertise to because they actually offer a greater return on investment to advertisers. And as a result, the ad algorithm trying to minimize cost shows the ad to fewer women. And so the big punchline here is that what may look like bias actually is the result of unintentional consequences of other actors' economic behavior. Um, implications for practice. You know, it's not often you write a paper where there's a really easy solution to the problem you identify, but there is here. If you're an advertiser and you're worried about reaching men and women equally, which may be an issue if you're insurance, finance, any form of employment or recruiting, 
then it's easy to solve this. You just have to think I'm going to manage my, uh, my campaigns for men and women separately and then make sure that I get it equal. Now, that may seem a very obvious thing to do, but we've actually presented this to some big insurance firms over in London and none of them have thought of this before, right? They were like, oh, we'll do that. And so it's actually a very nice and satisfying experience because usually you sort of suggest something that, like that's very expensive, difficult and all of these things. Instead, no, ooh, we can do it. So that was a nice result. Uh, as long as you know it, you can do it. Um, but maybe the more troubling implications and why we're here, given this is Technology Policy Institute, is that this kind of paper should emphasize that if we're worried about discrimination or bias in algorithms, it's not clear that some of the often talked about policy solutions are going to be helpful. And why is this? Well, algorithmic transparency is a beautiful slogan, but it's not quite clear how we would have helped here. In that if you looked at the algorithm, you'd have just seen what looked like a very nerdy algorithm designed by economists trying to make things cost effective. And as a result, it suggests there does need to be a lot more nuance and maybe a realization it's going to be a lot more complex to try and regulate than we were previously thinking. With that, I'll say thank you and hand you over for comments. Um, and of course, you can come back to all of that if people yeah. want. So, okay, so this is just a quick discussion of, uh, of, uh, of, of Catherine's great talk. Um, so quickly, what they did, they did a field experiment, um, placed an ad for STEM jobs on Facebook in 191 countries, and tested possible hypotheses that might explain the result. And they find that men are shown the ad significantly more often than women, and women were more likely to click on the ad if they see it. So the problem here is that uh, if women are less likely to see the ads for STEM jobs, then it can perpetuate the jobs being male-dominated, and then you're sort of left in this, in this cycle. Um, but they reject that there's a social bias uh, driving it, um, with their empirical analyses build in these, these differences in gender bias uh, across countries, and so they can, the way they, can, they can reject that particular hypothesis. Uh, and conc they conclude, after their various tests, that um, basically the reason is that women are more valuable than men to advertisers. So the advertisers are going to bid up the price for women. And if you're in a gender neutral, running a gender neutral campaign and not differentiating by women, uh, men and women, then you're gonna get, your ads will get crowded out by people who are targeting women specifically. Um, and so, and based on that, algorithmic transparency isn't going to help because it's the um, it's the uh, the uh, because it's 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 the economics underlying it that's driving this uh, driving this problem, not not the bias, not any bias in the algorithm. And the bigger implication, of course, is that uh, the computer science and the raw statistics alone aren't enough. You've got to understand the economics behind it. You really need to understand how the ad. Uh, the, the ad auctions work and, and so on. All right. Um, so the first thing, and, and, and actually Catherine started talking about this, was that the qu first question I had was how firms are responding to it. And you, you answered that with the surprising response that they haven't thought about it at all, which is really interesting given that the male-female uh, breakdown is one of the first things they, they tell you when you look at the analytics. Um, and uh, so... Uh, so, but then, if, if since they they haven't thought of it, now they are thinking about it. I wonder what the um, how much more you if you can estimate how much more they have to spend um, to uh, to get to generate a uh, um, to generate equal uh, an equal number of impressions because uh, it it could be I suspect it's not a small number um, and uh, they uh, and, and so they have to make some real changes um, now beyond that. This focuses really on the number of impressions, how many times the ad gets seen. Um, and you know, we look at our own social media feed and you see the number of impressions, and I'm not convinced they mean anything. Um, you, know, you see you spend this much money and you get two million impressions. That just means people scrolled by it. And you know, you're more interested in the number of clicks, but if you multiply through the number of clicks, uh, because women click on it more frequently, so you see that they only saw about 80% uh, the number of uh, ads number of times that men did, women click, see, you know, click on it at, al at almost exactly the same 
uh, number of times, it's the same rate, uh, not the same rate, but the same number of times that, that men do, which uh, Catherine said. Uh, and so what, what does that, you know, does that, does that mean anything at all? Um, you know, which one, which one matters more? Uh, and then if it's, if it's clicks, are you, you know, is there a particular, are you, you know, is there any way to know what groups of women you're missing um, who would have seen that ad otherwise? And she also, you get the same, uh, same results with, with Google. Um, but the Instagram story is really interesting. Um, because women see way fewer ads than men did and clicked on them less frequently too. And that's completely the opposite. Uh, I mean, the, the impressions isn't the opposite. The, the click rate and the number of clicks is, is exactly the opposite. And I think this deserves a, some more thought. Um, and one of the, uh, you know, what Catherine says in the paper, in this instance, the disparity in click rate by gender may have exacerbated the algorithm's allocation of the ad. But that comes right back to the first question, um, that maybe, there is something in the algorithm that's making the problem worse. Uh, and, you know, what, is there just something specific to, um, to, uh, to Instagram or in this draw, in, in, this, in, in this particular uh, experiment, it's sort of something tipped over the line that caused it uh, that might have, might have happened in others or may not happen in others. So basically, you know, my two critiques here is, the first is maybe the results show that algorithm bias um, is not much of a problem, given that the clicks are the, are the, the, the click uh, the number of clicks are probably the same. And the other one, of course, is exactly the opposite: that maybe the pro the problem is much worse than we think, because um, there is some tipping point built into these algorithms um, that exacerbates the problem. Uh, so that's just very quickly my thoughts. Um, this paper is really it's just excellent. Um, but we should go back to Catherine now um, to answer I questions. Question. Yeah. It's actually more, like, this is sort of more of a critique of me than, and, you know, my sort of like reaction to the paper. In that I've always been really happy, secretly, that women clicked on the ad more than men. And that is because typically when I present the results for the first time, economists always assume it is self-inflicted and that women just don't click on the ad. And so it goes against their intuition and that's just good and satisfying. That it's not women's own fault, right? However, I think Scott is exactly right to emphasize here that if ever women don't behave in the way that I like them to, to make me feel good in front of economists, then the results get really disturbing, right? Because if the algorithm learns that the cheaper group are more likely to click on it, why would it ever show it to the more expensive, unlikely to click on it group? So I think, you know, as you say, it's disturbing. I'm pleased the former was two, at least on two major networks, Google or on Facebook. But this can show that if it all goes the wrong way, it can go wrong very, very quickly, as you were saying. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So Facebook is attractive because it's actually deterministic. I know we probably don't remind remember all that time ago when we signed up for it, but it does actually make you say you're female or male, though it's now, I think, more courteous to people for whom that's not a clear question. Um, uh, for an Instagram, because they had the Facebook data, that's also deterministic. Uh, Twitter is most definitely probabilistic and not very reliable, at least if you look at sort of popular. I don't know if you've ever gone to see what gender Twitter thinks you are, right? It definitely thinks I'm a man. You know, maybe we'll see, you know, what we can, maybe, maybe you'll find out, you know, your Hispanic female history there. But 
Um, so it's less reliable. I think that's one of the reasons it gives gave me the less data on this than any other platforms. Google just doesn't really tell you. I'm guessing it's probabilistic, but maybe probabilistic. It may be my mix, yeah. They're, but they, they're, they're certainly... Uh, I haven't found anything which tells you. Nobody tells you. <laughs> but I asked a guy at a recent conference, a guy from Google, and it's like they have a bunch of four different things. Like, um, I can't remember now exactly what they're doing, but he told me something. It was a mixture of where they collected and where they mashed it together. So yeah. they collected through... Um, mm -hmm. Collect for maps, <laughs> play, um, search, uh, and there was one other thing, Adometry. I don't know, I can't remember. And then, like, they have different ad platforms. Adometry, which is something they bought. Yeah. Uh, Dark for Publishers, their ad network. Google Analytics, and something else. I can't remember. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, I, I like one of the conclusions. Disclosing the source code of the formula won't do you much good in trying to assess what this problem is all about. I think that's a good conclusion. But another one might be the importance of actually having gender information. Mm. Often people say, you know, one way to make sure that your algorithm isn't biased is to ignore gender information or racial information or whatever the protected class is. And here it seems to me that if you're going to address the issue raised by <coughs> You have to have knowledge, or but knowledge is better, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the gender category. I'm, I'm wondering if that is also an implication of your funding. Okay, I mean, that's a really nice point, right? So let's imagine that we were an employer, an employer such as you, who really is concerned that we don't have any bias in who we show the ads to, right? Now, you can imagine that even if Facebook decides to take away female, that there might be proxies of the behavior in the data which advertisers could use to bid me up. So for example, perhaps my interest in children, that makes me, that makes me very valuable, right? I might buy stuff for kids. Well, in fact, I buy, actually, I just buy everything in my own household. So, you know, that data in itself and I'm not alone, right? That sort of shows that's quite similar. You know, if you look for proxies of being in control of purchasing decisions, which they could find in their data, we could get exactly the same result, but we just wouldn't know it was happening because we didn't have gender, right? So that's slightly uneasy, right? I don't know what to make of that, right? Because so we have, we have to present more data to make sure that the, that data is not being used against us, which is always an uneasy conclusion. There's always this tension between collecting sensitive information which allows discrimination to take place uh, and collecting sensitive information in order to determine that it has taken place and to try to mitigate it. And I think in your situation, what you determined is that knowing what the gender is is, is crucial to find mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I love the paper, but I was wondering if you could uh, mm, share some information about algorithmic transparency. In particular, you say algorithmic transparency is not the answer, or might not be the answer. So at least we don't have evidence to, to design strong policy measures yeah. to back up uh, algorithmic transparency, because it's not clear that it is a factor. Have there been uh, pilots, example of algorithm transparency, and uh, that show to what yeah. extent any policymaker, any government official, or any researcher is able to detect bias in the algorithm through the algorithm transparency? Okay, so I think this is really good. Um, I was trying to get on my own. I was going to bring up the Angela Merkel slide again. So in some ways, this is a bigger issue in Europe. And then it becomes uneasy because, of course, in Europe, we know there's a lot of unease about the fact that U.S. companies have been relatively successful relative to European ones. And we suddenly have a policy which sounds like we're going to put a lot of intellectual prophecy out there on the Internet for a certain reason, you know, for what sound like good-sounding reasons, right? 
So from my experience in Europe, it's only been talk. And I think one of the reasons it has only been talk is that when I've talked to actual computer scientists, they just tend to burst into uproarious laughter that this is an idea that is possible in that if you think how much code really underlies a complex mechanism such as AdWords, right? You know, we're, you know, <laughs> we're not on the Bible, we're not on Shakespeare, we're in a lot longer body of work which is all interlinked in almost incomprehensible ways. And so I think one of the reasons we haven't seen it happen is because it's actually virtually impossible. It just sounds like a good idea. So I haven't, I haven't seen any pilots. And maybe other people in the room can correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't heard, even if you found a simple pilot, an example where it's been successful at weeding out bias. I think the one thing, you know, if you were to be nice, I think the one thing you can say is that it would act as a deterrent if I was um, a company in Europe where there are clearer protected classes, for example, ever putting female in as a defined field. That's all you can say there. There were some other questions. Yes? Oh, I sort of skipped through this part, but actually, if you, we had, um, or rather my, we had this huge data set of purchase behavior of Facebook ads for household items. And what we found is women actually are less likely to click on average than men on these ads. So it's not the case that women always click more. It's quite unusual, actually, than clicking more on these STEM ads, right? That's not general. What we did see for household items is that conditional on a woman clicking, she is more likely to buy. And therefore, think how beautiful that is from a return of investment point of view. That if I'm paying for clicks, what I really care about is your conversion conditional on clicking. So it's coming from the fact that women are more make, like to make a positive purchase decision. So we chose household items. That's just because we had the data. Um, from what I know of, there's sort of a more general likely, uh, let me, I skipped through this slide, but let me just get this, this. Um, if you look at the stuff which, which advertisers tend to advertise, women control 85% of those, well, 70, 85%, which, depending on what numbers you see. So I think you can think of this as sort of general, generally the stuff that gets advertised to, advertised, women control it, are more likely to purchase, and that what make, that's what makes them higher high high as an audience. I guess, is there any, like, so for, for example, like, you or convert, so we don't know anything. I mean, it was just a nice, you know, it was a very well-meaning website of the kind that undergraduate females aged 20 to 21, who were the research team, found useful and appealing. It didn't give anything more concrete, apart from the talk about how you build up a career ad. There was no way of measuring conversions for STEM ads in particular. Instead, it's just more the general idea, I guess, that at least in the US, we're very concerned about females not even having this information. So we think the information by itself may be valuable, whether or not you see conversion in any sense. Yes? This is uh, piggybacking off of yeah. what you had mentioned. I am very curious about the idea of female eyes being more expensive. And, um, and I, 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 I beg your pardon, because I just want to conceptualize this yes. as best as I can. But that means that uh, my eyes are more expensive because to an advertiser, well, Facebook will tell an advertiser, because Cheryl Harris's eyes are more expensive, you must pay more to put this ad so that Cheryl will see it and therefore buy your stuff. That's right. Okay. So with, I mean, with that said, I am fascinated by this, the concept, the policy solution that can become of what you've written here, especially with Angela Merkel's 
in Bristol's view, I'm trying to get this you know, algorithm transparency. I'm actually a little bit more interested about the concept of whether or not there's this, the algorithms are biased, right? And it's interesting because underneath that, there are so many other issues about why my eyes are expensive. And I'm less likely to earn more than a man. I'm less likely to um, even be in an occupation that may, in terms of human capital, pay me what I'm worth. And I'm just thinking that, you know, behind all of this, if the bias isn't in the algorithm, then the bias is in the in, in Facebook and the advertisers. I mean, I think this is a hugely deep issue, right? So if you look at the economics literature, there's always been the assumption that the discriminated against group is somewhat treated as less economically valuable. And so if you look at the 1970s literature on discrimination, underlying that was always the assumption that in, eco in an economic, you know, economically rational world, if you're discriminated against, don't worry. Eventually the market will pick up the fact that you're productive and will take advantage of the fact you're cheaper. What's strange here and what's paradoxical as you're saying is that you have a potentially discriminated against group of females who are suddenly more expensive due to advertisers' knowledge about their ability to, co to determine household cons cons consumption decisions. And so there are just so many spillovers, if you think about that way of approximating value, it sort of takes us a long way from traditional, sim you know, more simple models of discrimination. And I think one way of generalizing what you're saying is that in the world of algorithms and complexity, you know, you're wrestling with how can I be more expensive but paid less in the workforce, right? It's going to become a more consistent question. Right. And then at the same time, I'm not seeing as many jobs that would maybe pay me more. They, you may not be because you're seeing too many ads for yogurts and children's equipment. I, I kind of liken this like the opposite of it, like the bizarre world of this is the fashion industry in which it's one of the few occupations that a female will be paid more than a man, and yet not women don't make enough income to really keep up with the fashion that's presented to them. So it's, it is kind of, it's very odd. Yeah. I think there's not enough data to, to, to know other characteristics of the subset of the women who actually do get served as that. Um, so I'll tell you, we have some data, but unfortunately, uh, I'll, I'll be honest and say Christmas, the Christmas holidays happen, so it's not quite complete. But one thing we tried to do on Facebook, which fascinated me, was we actually looked to see what happens if you use other criteria, such as whether or not I had an affinity for engineering. Now, if you look and compare women and men who have affinity for engineering, then the discrepancy is even more pronounced. And why is that? Well, as soon as I become a female who is interested in engineering, I'm going to be living in a wealthy zip code, which means I've just become that much more valuable, maybe to all those fashion firms. You say you're the one person who can actually afford the, you know, the high fashion, the expensive items. And so if anything, I think we've got more specific criteria that it could, especially if that criteria is to indicate wealth, you could see this being even worse. Mm -hmm. Yes? So, uh, looking at our own demographic data that we get back from Google, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, it's all skewed here. So um, we're getting demographic data back from Google Analytics and um, subsect segmenting our site from like our careers content versus our jobs board. The jobs board is more, um, everything is male dominated. Everything we've got is male dominated. The female, the job board is, is more equal. And I've, we actually look, I, I haven't really done any real analysis broken down for content by, by gender, but there are some differences. I looked at a year's 
data for our, so our YouTube posts, and almost all of our videos were 90% male, and there was like one or two where it was less, um, where the ratio was more favorable to women than men, which is kind of, I, I don't know what to make of all this. Well, it's interesting, because it comes back to this gentleman's question here, which was, you know, do we need the protected, the data of potentially protected class to work out we're doing stuff wrong, right? Because if I was in your, you know, that's in some sense sounds like a bit of a disturbing pattern, right? That we have almost equal representation on the job boards, but the tools you're trying to provide to help people get those jobs for whatever reason is skewing male. I mean, with that information, you can do something, even though it's, yeah. I don't know what it is, but it sounds, I mean, it's, I would fully it's really, just really interesting. Disturbing, but interesting, right? Is there something, you know, what is it about which is leading to that pattern? It's really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to follow up on one of the points. I mean, I wonder if you thought about it. Um, given what you know on the cost per click, yeah. uh, and the differences between male and female uh, prices. Do you have any estimate on w w how, what effect this would be, you know, have on digital spending? And a harder, I mean, purely normative question: yeah. Is it a lot of money, or you know, from a society's point of view, is it a tiny amount of money? That you okay, uh, so it's probably you know, if you sort of take it, my estimates seriously for a risk, you know, from this one campaign, the, the, the average cost in a rich society would be about 15% more for females. Though that would skew 15.15, but that would skew more if, I'm guessing, if you were to target people with, you know, PhDs or, you know, finish their, their, their master's program or something. Now, I have no idea how expensive that is in the world of recruiting. My guess is, my own impression is when you talk to people who try and deal with this and take it seriously, it's very little money. But, um, you know, but those are mainly people I've talked to who are involved in recruiting for highly specialized occupations who are very worried about that. And, you know, if you were to scale up to a bigger employer, I'm not sure. Do you have anything to, do you have anything on comparative? I could bar salesperson. Okay. I, I don't know that. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I would say probably it's less the money and more just like understanding these things, right? It surprised me. You know, when, when I've talked to this about to Facebook engineers, they're like, oh, yeah, of course that's going to happen. But it's just that people don't tend to think think about the consequences of it happening and so I think it's more like, you know, it's widespread that, it, that people haven't thought about it, but it's also widespread that when people think about it, they're like, oh, we can do something. service announcement mm. a kind of uh, they should be uh, basically focused on specific on their specific targets they sh should actively try to reverse the reality and fo for instance in this case if you are doing a, if you if your goal basically if your goal is to encourage women to push for stem you do the advertising only for stem exactly as companies do so basically in terms of uh, in, in terms of uh, using uh, so does it call what I mean is does it call for greater use of Facebook ad by government to somehow mm. balance yes, this uh, yes. so enter into a market as a kind of public That's procurement good. measure government as a spender well you know let me tell you so I'm not a, legal, uh, a lawyer but I was lucky enough as I say at the National Bureau of Economic Research to be uh, discussed by someone called Ben Edelman, who is a lawyer, and also he's a lawyer who really loves lawsuits. He loves launching lawsuits. And so he was positively gleeful about the number of lawsuits that this 
particular paper could launch <laughs> in the general idea being that once you know about this problem, then you have very little defense to not act upon it. Now, he was thinking, I think, mainly about you know, the class actions that could be launched, potentially. But another way of taking his glee and his legal interpretation is that there would be a role for try for at least potentially any time that Facebook sees something as an employment ad or something like that, having a box saying, do you want to balance the vendors? Tick, yes, no. I, I, I have a quick question. Um, I noticed that uh, looking at a lot of the literature on gender STEM related issues, um, one thing that seems to be overlooked, and this is something that Paula Steven and her colleagues have pointed out, that the experiences of women of color are different from white women, um, especially why they choose to leave STEM and uh, mobility, job mobility, and so forth. Uh, I, I'm just curious, could this be broken down even further if you just like left it in maybe one country, the United States or Canada, and look at um, ethnicity, race, and the breakdown of women in, in this group and how the ad, the advertisers see them differently? And okay, really, value? the answer is it becomes more difficult simply because uh, Facebook does not directly collect data of race. Instead what it does is it uses a probabilistic model to predict what it calls your ethnic affinity. Now I have a different paper which shows that ethnic affinity prediction, we are talking about probabilistic models, is horrible. And the reason it is horrible, and you can think how it could interact with this, this data, is because it uses, it tries to predict if you're African American based on whether you like cultural objects which you consider to be African American. African American mo uh, movies, African American TV shows. The problem it has though is that whether or not you like movies or music on Facebook is also determined by your income, right? My guess is that everyone in this room we probably haven't liked a movie or you know, music on Facebook for a long time. Uh, instead, you know, rich people, when you look at their behavior on Facebook, they tend to like, I kid you not, they like companies and facts. <laughs> <laughs> but they really do. And Dan Rather. Actually, if you like Dan Rather, that's the best predictor of being rich. Now, the problem is, this means, if you can think about it, if you look at that data, it means it's going to only identify you as a person of color if you're low income. And so then trying to store this alongside this kind of data, and you could end up with the horrible outcome that female, uh, that female African Americans with high educational credentials, for example, would never see an ad trite which is aimed to be targeted at them. Right, so the answer is it gets, maybe it gets more worse and more complicated. Yes. I was going to actually ask a similar question. If we're seeing such disparities just in gender, I imagine there would be huge disparities on the income level. And it, it, there is, and that's because we move, you know, at least gender is deterministic, right? But when an algorithm has to predict something about you, that's where almost the problems can really begin, right? Because you know we were just talking there about the fact that rich people behave very differently from poor people on Facebook. So that's going to mess up any attempt at probabilistic prediction, right? Yeah. So obviously, going back to the policy implications. So if algorithmic transparency is not the solution, this kind of research is the solution. So a kind of uh, exposed uh, ex experimental analysis of, of behavior. Mm -hmm. And my question is then, how expensive it is? Can it upscale? And Ooh. I'm not, not, I don't have here. Well, you know, it sounds very self-serving to say that I am the answer. Replicated in time <laughs> and in different 
Yeah. For different segments and for different cases. And so. Okay, so uh, let me tell you, this is one of the cheapest papers I've ever written. <laughs> we spend, you know, business school academic, we usually spend money, like, like you know, a lot of money. Uh, this, the main campaign in 190 com countries cost about $5,000. Uh, the replication on the four different ad platforms cost $200 each, as we were just looking at the US. So the good news is, you know, that's someone coughing at the FTC, right? I don't know what that is. It's not much money. Just to give you an example, the European Commission has launched a tender on algorithmic transparency worth 400,000 euros right now. One study, one off. <laughs> How many of these studies can you found with this? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yes, the, the, the good news is that it doesn't take much money, right? I think what it does take, though, is that, you know, this is a, I'll be honest and say I love this paper, but it's such an odd duck in the world of economics. It's not clear that the incentives will be there. You know, I've got tenure. It's not clear that the incentives will be there for the academics. So that, that, that's the problem, not the money, the incentives for academics, right? Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the question.